Afrique Média. Le monde, c'est nous. BRICS uh, leaders are gearing up for their 15th summit of head of state built uh, to run from today, Tuesday, the 22nd to the 24th of August 2023 in South Africa, city of Johannesburg. The summit, which holds at a crucial moment across the globe, is expected to see South Africa, India, Brazil, Russia, and China discuss a range of issues concerning the bloc and others, including areas like expansion, the BRICS bank, economic expansion, and global politics. The BRICS countries should be noted have become significant players in the global economy individually. These nations possess vast resources, large populations, and rapidly growing economies. Collectively, they represent a substantial share of the world's GDP, trade, and population. As it stands, BRICS is among the blocks advocating for pragmatic reforms of existing, existing international institutions and uh, to create new platforms that will better reflect the realities of a multipolar world. The BRICS seeks, among others, to reshape global economic roles, address political and security challenges, and promote sustainable development while understanding and respecting the uh, new definition of uh, sovereignty. Thus, today's program views on the continent seeks to discuss the major stakes of, of the uh, uh, BRICS summit, which is holding in uh, Johannesburg in South Africa, and how the bloc's ideologies could help redefine global perspectives, especially in areas like governance, international cooperation, and uh, many more. So uh, this is what we are going to be discussing uh, in the course of the program Views on the Continent on African Media today, looking at the major stakes or issues uh, that uh, surrounds the uh, uh, ongoing BRICS summit in uh, South Africa, that is precisely in the city of uh, Johannesburg. <laughs> Afrique Média. Le monde, c'est nous. Hello all and thanks for joining us uh, this day. It's another edition of the program Views on the Continent on your Pan-African television, Africa Media. Today, we want to discuss the ongoing BRICS Summit in uh, South Africa and looking at major stakes or issues that will surround the discussions as leaders of uh, these uh, uh, BRICS nations are meeting uh, to brainstorm, which we have highlighted, uh, among others, the issue of uh, expansion, the issue of the BRICS Bank, looking at how uh, they can reshape, of course, or bring reforms in international institutions, of, of course, practical reforms in inst international institutions, especially at a moment of uh, uh, a, 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 a geopolitical shift across the globe, and of course, what are the stakes. So today, we are going to analyze constructively, as always been the case, to analyze the place of BRICS in uh, the world today and see how the meeting in South Africa will be a game changer, not just for BRICS states, but also for the continent Africa and other nations uh, seeking to share in uh, the ideologies of uh, the uh, BRICS nations. Without uh, wasting much time, we go straight away uh, to unveiling the panel that will give us uh, a great uh, analysis on this uh, important issue, the stakes surrounding the BRICS summit holding at the, play, uh, the, the moment of uh, the quest for change in a, a very uh, pertinent aspect of uh, the uh, society. Are we talking governance? Are we talking sovereignty? Or are we talking international cooperation? Uh, this is what we are going to be analyzing. And uh, let's go to Moscow. We are being joined uh, by Yulia Burke, who is joining in her capacity as a political scientist. It's a pleasure having you this day on the program, uh, Yulia. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, very happy to be here today. 
It's always a pleasure having you. And of course, let's go to the United Kingdom. We are meeting Mr. Uh, Clinton Ellis. He's a geopolitical strategist, also electrical power engineer. It's always a pleasure having you to give us insight on very pertinent topic like this that we are discussing today, Mr. Ellis. Welcome. Opportunity to participate in this uh, conversation it is highly relevant, and so I would not miss this opportunity to give my two cents. And it's good to be back on the panel with yourself, of course, and uh, Miss 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 Berg. It is very imperative that we continue to hold analytical and, of course, constructive uh, discursive programs uh, like uh, this one uh, on African media to continue to edify or to uh, inform the global world uh, about the issues surrounding the BRICS and also how uh, the world, which is taking a multipolar dimension, can better function or correlate uh, without actually infringing on the autonomy or sovereignty of uh, states, nations, uh, uh, like we've always uh, done. I want us to have, first of all, a holistic uh, approach of the 15th uh, uh, BRICS summit and what it uh, holds for the block and, of course, the African continent as a whole. Let's kick off with you, uh, dear Yulia. Uh, well, I think uh, today's summit will be uh, probably as historical as some of the first ones were, right? Uh, because uh, um, a lot of expect expectations are being discussed, uh, not just around the uh, new members that might possibly be joining the um, alliance in these days. And we know that around 20 countries have applied officially to join the BRICS. Uh, and also um, around 50 countries are showing um, active interest, which is confirmed by their participation uh, in the summit in Johannesburg these days. So um, uh, that's point one, uh, one of the key points of interest. And uh, point two is the um, ongoing discussion and not just the discussion, but uh, uh, the proposals that were already being uh, drafted uh, proposals around uh, possible in uh, introdu introducing the possible uh, trade uh, uh, currency, right? So this is one of the key issues, and I think uh, the colleagues uh, present here today would elaborate more on why uh, this is essential. But uh, this uh, summit uh, that is uh, that is taking place in South Africa these days is definitely um, a historical event that might change the course of the global history. Which is very imperative for uh, changing the course of global history, which it will help uh, uh, all nations across uh, the, the globe. Uh, coming to you, Mr. Ellis, and of course, uh, while getting your holistic view of, of the ongoing BRICS summit in uh, South Africa, I will actually associate uh, this uh, with uh, this uh, question uh, like of how has the, the emergence of BRICS influenced global power dynamics and uh, challenge uh, the uh, dominance of traditional global pairs? Uh, because in our preamble, we highlight, uh, uh, highlighted the place of BRICS in uh, advocating for reforms of uh, international uh, institutions, especially on areas of governance, sovereignty, and everything. So now, uh, in your perspective, how has the emergence or how is the existence of uh, BRICS uh, influencing global per uh, dynamics uh, across the world? Clarus, um, I can remember a few years ago, I had a conversation with a friend of mine who is a businessman in the U.S. And when I mentioned BRICS to him, he kind of laughed and thought it was a, a bit of a joke because he could not, un, he could not see how um, anything could compete with the preeminence of the dollar. Um, and uh, so effectively, what transpired, what, what has transpired over the last few years is pretty remarkable in the sense that um, we could not have imagined that we're on the cusp of such an international paradigm shift where many have decided to attend the BRICS, even though there has been lots of international, um, like from the, the status quo powers, you know, um, that emerge or that exist rather in, in, the, in the UK, in the US, in Europe, who have been speaking down 
on the potential of BRICS. And so now looking at the situation, I'm, I'm absolutely quite um, amazed at the progress that has been made and that the shift that has taken place. The BRICS, what it means for the world is an alternative system that should, in theory, bring forth more prosperity to the world. The world has really been in dire need of um, a diversity, a diversification of the monetary system. And in terms of, um, you know, what, where we can get credit in order to develop the countries, especially developing countries um, that are so in need and dire need of development. And so what we're looking at right now with the BRICS is the opportunity to really lay um, significant, um, you know, uh, uh, I'd say movement into establishing this new system that should be based on a multipolarity, based on sovereignty, based on, you know, not, um, you know, trying to put the gun to the heads of countries whereby they would then have to um, agree to preconditions that would erode their sovereignty in order to have the opportunity to actually invest in their own economies. And so now at this stage, we expect for significant movement. And what I mean by this is, we need to see um, a, a framework and a timeline and a roadmap. Um, we want to see concrete, um, you know, roadmap in terms of what exactly will now take place. Back in July, um, I think the 7th of July, if I'm not mistaken, it was agreed that there would be launching a new currency and it was said that August would be the, the time in which there would be the emergence of a new currency. And, I would like to see from this meeting um, concrete decisions and steps made to launching that so that we can move because the world is waiting for something concrete. We've heard many different conversations. It's now time to move. You know, the people of Africa, the people of Brazil, the people of India and China um, cannot can wait no longer for progress. The people of Russia can wait no longer for progress. We need to see movement. We need to see concrete um, roadmaps and decisions that will kind of, that will be affecting you know the lives of people in a positive way because the U.S. dollar is essentially dead in terms of um, its its value. You know nothing essentially is is, is backing it obviously, and uh, it, it's it's um, a lot of countries have made the decision to dump the dollar and move towards something else, and so we need to see something more concrete. I hope. That um, you know, that, you know, we we have seen a lot of talking, you know. But now it's time for action. We need to see action. You know, we we need energy. We need um, you know, telecommunications. We need infrastructure. You know, roads. You know, we 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 need agriculture. You know, we need all of those things now. The people of Africa are waiting, in particular, which is where my heart is. You know, we are waiting to see movement on these things. You know, and so I think there's a great opportunity right now, but we need to see less timidity. And we need to see um, each government um, that are really interested in, in, in making an, um, like an influence in this take action right now to move into the new system so we can move. But we need to understand exactly what it is that they will be doing so that we can essentially throw our backing behind it and move forward. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Uh, Elisa, for the uh, uh, introductory uh, statement uh, regarding our topic for a discussion of course uh, how can BRICS make uh, the the difference uh, uh, because uh, a lot is happening especially across Mama Africa uh, like you fondly call and how uh, we're looking at how a block like BRICS can bring new perspectives and we're continuing the debate with you uh, dear Yulia L let's uh, take, uh, take this other, uh, other question you know we already highlighted the stakes of, of the uh, BRICS summit, looking at uh, the uh, uh, expansion, membership expansion. We're looking at uh, the, the, the BRICS bank and of course uh, uh, other issues. But uh, the question I'm directing to you now is, uh, to what extent has the BRICS group uh, been successful uh, in reshaping? Because uh, we, we need to talk about uh, uh, governance and see how, of, how all of these things can inculcate themselves and fully uh, uh, Peter in uh, the glo uh, the present context. So, to one extent, has the BRICS group been successful in reshaping uh, global governance and institutions to better reflect the interest of emerging economies? 
Um, well, I think that uh, at the moment, the existence of such uh, of such an alliance or such a, uh, a group of countries is already posing threats to um, the old uh, world order, uh, just simply because uh, just simply because um, I'm just trying to see if my connection is fine. Um, yes, uh, it's already posing threats uh, to the existing world order because BRICS was founded on completely different um, um, bases, right? So uh, uh, when BRICS was founded, it was all about mutually beneficial, respectful relationships where um, no um, uh, no entity could uh, dominate over other ones, right? So uh, BRICS is not even, uh, it doesn't even have its own bureaucracy at the moment. What BRICS is, is a contact group of the heads of states. And then um, there are other um, actors uh, communicating on a regular basis, and those are Sherpas or those could be ministers uh, that are focused in their discussions on uh, specific areas, right? And then uh, there are different kinds of NGOs, uh, research centers, et cetera, that are uh, completely grassroots, which means that they're founded by uh, individuals that have interest in developing cooperation between um, and among the uh, BRICS countries, right? So it's a very vivid, um, it's a very vivid uh, structure that does not have any uh, vertical, uh, you know, uh, governance line, uh, and it means that uh, members of uh, the BRICS countries and different uh, actors uh, taking part in BRICS activities are very much uh, free and flexible. They choose their partnerships uh, based on uh, how they perceive, uh, you know, the potential benefits or who join who joins them in terms of um, implementation of specific projects. So it's it's a completely different thing when we compare it to uh, the bureaucracy of the European Union or some other institutions. And of course, it has uh, its advantages and disadvantages. So uh, freedom uh, and uh, mutual respect and mutually beneficial approach is definitely are definitely some of the advantages. But at the same time, the disadvantages are um, the disadvantages are related to the fact that uh, it's less uh, formal and there is no, uh, let's say, one window system where you can address uh, a specific institution in order to um, get some um, get some, you know, feedback regarding um, uh, policies mentioned or regarding some of the projects, but it's a unique structure. And the example that it provides uh, to the whole world uh, is exactly about this, about, uh, you know, cooperation framework for um, independent and sovereign states that are able to uh, choose their policies and choose their partnerships uh, as uh, they prefer. Uh, that will be favorable to the nations. Uh, we're talking, uh, Yulia, you underline uh, that uh, BRICS actually practically does not have uh, a functional bureaucracy, and we know that with the, the changes, so the wind of change that has been blowing across the world, and particularly in Africa, and uh, the fact that many African countries are open to working uh, really hard with uh, the BRICS group, uh, do you think uh, this is the right moment uh, for the BRICS uh, to institute or instill uh, a practical, strong demo uh, bureaucracy uh, that will guide its functioning, uh, given uh, that uh, uh, there are still some people who are very uh, skeptical about uh, uh, the presence of some BRICS uh, uh, nations across Africa, and how can they use uh, this uh, maybe uh, uh, bureaucracy uh, to bring uh, changes, especially in the aspect of governance, transparency, and accountability, and how beneficial the uh, uh, relationship is between African states and uh, countries that belong to the, the BRICS. 
Well, we will see, uh, depending on uh, which trajectory uh, the BRICS uh, would choose, uh, we will see either some kind of bureaucracy developing or not, because at the moment, uh, when we talk about implementation of specific projects, and those could be also infrastructure projects and some other ones, uh, and uh, BRICS is dealing not just uh, with the BRICS countries, but also uh, there is uh, the so-called BRICS Plus format that implies pretty much an unlimited um, amount of countries uh, that uh, could be hiding behind this uh, plus mark, right? Um, but uh, depending on, yes, uh, the trajectory, uh, the trajectory, it will be uh, clear uh, if bureaucracy would be needed or let's say the projects would be just channeled through uh, the new development bank of BRICS uh, and key political decisions will be uh, made within this uh, summit, BRICS um, annual summit format and other issues will, will be uh, dealt with within the framework of BRICS Business Council and um, other institutions related to BRICS. So the point that I'm trying to make is that uh, it might be not uh, necessary to uh, create uh, an institution similar to the ones existing, let's say, in the uh, European Union or the African Union, because we see that um, it also uh, implies certain uh, problems and issues that arise uh, because, uh, well, uh, those institutions, uh, including the African Union, for instance, they do not really have uh, too many uh, mechanisms that they can use in order to uh, make sure that decision that the decisions that they take are being implemented by each country. So they issue recommendations, they uh, issue various kinds of statements and policies and analytical materials and many other things. Uh, yet uh, there is no um, opportunity to uh, uh, to force implementation of those decisions, and this is something that uh, defines authority. So in BRICS countries as well, uh, if uh, there was um, a um, an institution that would imply more, uh, you know, a more formal and bureaucratic structure, probably it wouldn't have um, those mechanisms. Uh, uh, aimed at, uh, you know, this kind of uh, uh, obligatory and forceful uh, implementation of the policies. And uh, maybe it's not even uh, necessary because, again, you know, different kinds of policies could already be channeled through other institutions and uh, the existence of such a, of such a uh, uh, body that would be, uh, you know, controlling implementation of those policies could kill uh, some of the spirit uh, with which uh, the BRICS was created. Absolutely. Uh, while uh, uh, wanting uh, to be heard, especially in the global perspective, it is also imperative uh, to uh, put in mind uh, the, the guiding principles of uh, the, the BRICS group. In the same perspective, uh, uh, Mr. Elise, uh, uh, like we have n noted already, that uh, one of the major areas of focus uh, for the BRICS nations is to increase the, uh, their involvement in uh, global alliance, uh, global politics or global governance, uh, w which we uh, this will aim at uh, seeing visible reforms, like we already underlined, in international uh, institutions and to create a platform that will better uh, reflect the realities of a multipolar world. So, uh, Mr. Ellis. The question is, in your perspective, what is the perfect modus operandi that the BRICS nation can actually uh, use and uh, which wouldn't uh, undermine the sovereignty of states that they want uh, to actually uh, work with? It's a very good conversation we're having because we can look at what the UN model has been able to accomplish or look at you know, the, you know, the IMF or the World Bank, and we can see exactly that it was very, very vertical in nature. So, you know, you, you had board members sitting there making decisions on behalf of countries. And of course, this means an erosion of sovereignty. And that has always been um, the cry of, of, of states that um, there is too much control 
on the part of these um, institutions. They have too much power in terms of how they influence the direction of countries in terms of what policies that they are able to actually pass through their governments. But as an engineer, understand that you need a structure in order to execute projects, right? You cannot execute projects without having a clear path because we do SWOT analysis, which looks at the strengths, the weaknesses, the opportunities and the threats on the model that we have. Of course, the strengths of the BRICS is that countries have more sovereignty. But at the same time, if you look at the, the weaknesses, it, it, it things don't move very fast because if, I'm a, if, if I want to invest on projects as the private sector, you know, and I'm interested in tying myself, um, you know, in, in, in terms of the BRICS, I need to be able to do risk analysis, financial risk analysis, and the financial risk analysis I'll be looking at is, okay, fine, what is the, the environment looking like in terms of security for me to go in there and to invest the money? I need to be able to look at the governance and understand the governance structure in order to evaluate, um, you know, the, the, you know, the possibility or the feasibility of, of the project that I'm looking to move into so that, because big projects require government involvement and government involvement means policy and policy means economic policy, right? And economic policy goes into finance because that has to do with taxes. And of course, the private sector wants to have a clear path so that it, it, it has the confidence to say, okay, fine. I think based on our evaluation, we can go in there and we can have a public private partnership aligned with the BRICS in order to execute certain projects that are needed. And so I understand that it's a, a new architecture and it's a new governance, which of course is very different to the established, but the established, the establishment of the IMF and, and, and the World Bank, they have been able to achieve a lot in terms of infrastructural development in, you know, in when they, they have, I mean, they may have done it poorly, but they've been able to get private money invested in, 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 in countries for development. And so what we need to do is not to throw the baby out with the bathwater. We need to analyze carefully to see where the strengths are and incorporate those and have the security of the risk of um, subversion of sovereignty. What can we do as BRICS to have policies that will protect us from such subversion of sovereignty, which has been the key problem with the architecture of the previous system that we're moving away from. And so at the end of the day, I look about a lot of things need to happen. Trillions need to be spent in order to get um, Africa developed, whether it's energy or it's telecommunications or it's roads or it's talking about, um, you know, you know, factories, manufacturing, you know, intellectual exchanges and all of these things need to be wrapped up into, a, into an agenda and then you need to have the various committees or steering committees with enough democratizations inside of it in order to um, avoid the risk of um, subversion of sovereignty. Um, but we need to have a structure, right? So, um, you know, um, Mrs. Berg has launched in Russia the AREA project, which is the Africa um, Russia Energy Association, which looks to bring together both um, you know, all the private sector and governance and, and, and the public sector to see how it is that we can execute energy projects, right? And this is really, uh, um, you know, a format that could be used for each of the areas. Telecommunications could have a similar um, structure, right? You could have, you know, um, you know uh, roads, you know, what are the best strategies for implementation of, of roads that, that are needed, of railway lines? You know, we need solid framework because private money needs to be invested because it cannot just be the government that is through taxation that is actually executing these projects. You need to encourage the private sector to participate in these projects, which means risk analysis, SWOT analysis. Okay, it's feasible, but why is it feasible? It's feasible because the governance structure offers me the security that I'm going to get the return on my investment yeah. after 10 years, after 15 years, after 20 years. Otherwise, it is just talking, right? We need solid frameworks, you know, so we cannot throw the baby out with the bath water in terms of, 
you know, the structure of the UN. If you look at the UN, for example, how it was able to influence the entire world in terms of energy policy is that it has a committee there in, in Switzerland. It creates an outline of framework, what it wants to achieve. It communicates with the various ministries. They all meet together. They discuss it. And then before long, policy is being created in the various countries in alignment with this target. So the question is, how can BRICS learn, take what it has to take from the, the, the former system or the dying system and add to it, you know, um, fail safes, right? Of the risk of subversion of sovereignty. Because at the end of the day, we need to have something quite solid as the private sector to then go and invest our money. So there needs to be more in terms of discussion about how, what models is BRICS going to use to execute these projects in terms of infrastructural um, um, investment. And, and the BRICS Development Bank is key to this. You know, it, it, it must be able to lead from the front, right? We don't have to necessarily agree with it, but it needs to create something that we can all examine to see the efficacy. How can it work? Because, you know, we, we need more meat on the bone. It's not enough. As an engineer, I've designed, I've helped to design multi-billion pound projects. So I understand the feasibility assessments that go into analyzing whether or not we want to put our money there to see what I mean. And so we need more meat on the bone. We need more practical people sitting there. We need a business community to be very active in telling the governments what it is that it needs in order to execute these projects. Because a lot of energy projects need to be created, you know, and, and a lot of, you know, edu whether it's education infrastructure, what is going to go into creating policy for education? And can the BRICS Development Bank assist in these areas? You know, can the BRICS Development Bank and how would you go about creating the railway lines that are needed to facilitate into Africa? If it's Africa, I'm, I'm, I'm quite concentrating on Mama Africa because that is really my passion. Into Africa trade, across border trade, right? I mean, you know, so there needs to be a lot of more discussions taking place here, you know, and this is really where I'm at right now. We need to see concrete steps, concrete proposals, roadmaps, potential models for implementation, and all the various parties that are required, of course, the stakeholder from the ground, the people need to be involved. How do we incorporate the people in, in terms of creation of these um, roadmaps? And how do we make sure that we're listening to the people simultaneously? How are we taking the business community's opinion that is so strategically important um, into consideration? So these are the things that I know that are needed, you know, in order for this thing to start to bring forth the fruit. The fruit needs to be brought forth. All right, and this is really, you know, where I'm at. Alice, uh, let me write off with you again, uh, uh, dear Yulia. Uh, talking, uh, uh, talking lately, you underlined, which Mr. Alice have also underlined, uh, the, the aspect of uh, the BRIC uh, Bank or the BRIC Development Bank. And we know that it has been very problematic across Africa lately, uh, looking at uh, the uh, International Monetary Bank and the World Bank and the, the loans they actually give out to the African uh, countries. And we, 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 they seem to be very problematic because at the end it's not meeting uh, its objective and many African nations are becoming more and more uh, uh, indebted. So the question is, what uh, difference will the BRICS Development Bank make aside? Because here we want to bring out the peculiarities of the BRICS block because many countries like we have seen want to really engage with BRICS. And we also underline that the, this aspect of wanting to, to bring about uh, uh, an end to Western hegemony. And we're looking at uh, the, the dollar, which is of, of course uh, uh, rolling in terms of uh, the, the, the money. Now, how can the BRICS make a different in this aspect of maybe uh, loans for development that will not indeed uh, maybe make countries indebted. And of course, and uh, this aspect of is it for the benefit 
of the continent or how can Africa, in your perspective, how do you think uh, nations across Africa can benefit from this in order to, to bring forth or a, a clear trajectory in the economic sphere? Uh, we, uh, Mr. Ellis mentioned the aspect of the African uh, economic integration and the continental free trade area. Uh, well, um, it's necessary to highlight the fact that um, uh, most of the uh, infrastructure projects are not really much commercial um, in terms of the, uh, the business models we're used to um, we're, we're used to um, in regular um, you know commercial or business um, area, right? Because when you talk about any kinds of uh, infrastructure projects from uh, roads to energy or telecommunications what uh, mr ellis was just mentioning uh, it's something that pays off uh, in uh, decades right and uh, that as well is not always guaranteed so uh, investment in this kind of projects is always uh, uh, you know quite risky so what uh, international um, uh, financial institutions, what they get in return right now is uh, basically state uh, guarantees or uh, translating it into the practical language that implies control over sovereign states and control over their policies from international policies to domestic policies. So the key difference that is supposed to be observed uh, in terms of the way uh, the uh, uh, BRICS New Development Bank functions is that uh, the terms and conditions for that kind of investment to be provided should be very much different uh, comparing to the terms and conditions of uh, the International Monetary Fund and uh, some other institutions that, uh, as we could have observed on uh, various examples, that try to get uh, directly under the skin uh, rights of sovereign states, uh, starting to uh, dictate uh, um, the uh, reforms that uh, those are supposed to focus on, uh, trying to implement uh, their own value systems and trying to implement their own policies including some of the absolutely uh, absurd ones right so the uh, the new development bank uh, is uh, a very different institution in terms of this kind of approach and uh, the ones that are still remaining skeptical about it could just uh, take a look at the example of china and the way it does business and it does uh, investment i mean there are many things that can be said about uh, the typical Chinese policies, including the ones uh, visible on the African continent. But what um, what cannot be denied is that uh, China, unlike uh, uh, some of the um, Western, let's say, American or Euro European institutions, they're not trying to, uh, uh, to impact and influence uh, domestic policies of the states, right? Uh, not trying to um, not trying to implement their own value systems uh, within those um, countries. So um, that is uh, the key difference because, well, um, uh, again, uh, going back to the point made, uh, made at the very beginning, uh, infrastructure projects, including roads, energy, telecommunications, education, and many other ones, uh, they pay off uh, not directly in money, but in the uh, quality of life. In, in uh, they pay off in terms of the, uh, uh, you know, well, general overall living conditions of the people, their quality of life, their level of happiness, and other things that cannot always be directly measured in uh, clear numbers and digits because in terms of the uh, financial returns infrastructure uh, projects and the ones oriented at social welfare um, they do not always uh, yes pay off uh, really well so instead of trading that for uh, you know obedience uh, to uh, obedience to uh, someone's uh, requests in terms of domestic and international policies, uh, those should be oriented on uh, the uh, common good uh, of the uh, global community. And uh, those issues are some of the issues that uh, we have been discussing uh, 
for uh, over than a year by now with uh, within the uh, Globus expert community, and uh, those questions were also being raised in terms of how would it differ, you know, uh, how would it differ in terms of um, uh, implementation of projects by the New Development Bank uh, comparing to other um, international um, institutions, and the difference should be uh, exactly this. Uh, absence of uh, interference uh, into policies where it's not related to implementation of the projects uh, themselves. Okay, uh, thank you. Can I just oh. jump in here, Paris? Well, you want okay to add to something to that, Mr. Elise? Okay, yes, of course. I, I, oh, okay. I understand yeah. what Mrs. Burke is saying. Yeah. But I want to emphasize that when the government is going to execute projects, it has to tax the population. Therefore, somebody has to pay. Um, it goes into the public purse, this checkup. And um, therefore, there needs to be checks and balances on government spending. And what is a good methodology for bringing checks and balances to government spending? It is the private sector. When you have a model that actually says, you know what, we, we're going to invite, um, you know, private organizations to have a respond to a tender, whether it's energy systems or anything, right, a tender, to give the best offer or to take the best strategy for executing a specific project, right? Competition is important, right? So in China, China has state-owned, you know, uh, you know, businesses, right? And, and of course, it will just use its it's, it's revenue generated from taxes to execute the project, no matter what it costs, it will just do it. But at the same time, if you look at how they've gone about building all these cities, it's a waste. They've wasted trillions, right? And so, you know, it's important to, to understand that the Chinese model is not really the most effective model. And the Chinese, and the Chinese have had um, also, um, you know, the you know, very, I think preferred treatment because the, the, the World Trade um, Organization, when they were allowed to join, they had preferential treatment in terms of policy. So most of the world sent their manufacturing to China and there was no competition between China and say Bang, uh, uh, Thailand, you know, and, and other Southeast Asian countries to say, we are better able to create a better environment for executing this project. It was just a decision made. China gets the preferential treatment. And therefore, China had essentially a blank check or uh, 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 you know, carte blanche mm -hmm. to, to do whatever it, it needed to do. And of course, it has risked a lot of money has been wasted. So we cannot afford to have a system whereby we're replicating the Chinese model in BRICS and then getting bitten by taxes being paid you know, um, by the, 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 the local population or the resources of, of the population getting wasted. There has to be checks and balances. The private sector must be involved in these projects because it's the best way to ensure that um, whatever um, the project that will be executed, it needs to make financial economic sense over a period of time, right? Because you want, of course, to invest in energy, but you want to know you, you've invested in the, in the most efficient energy system, not just any energy system. You want the most cost-effective energy system. So you get value for money. Reagan says, it's the economy stupid. Everything, we understand the politicking. We don't want, um, you know, uh, states, you know, overriding the sovereign preferences of countries in terms of economic policy. Yeah. You want countries um, essentially doing what is best for its people and, and and executing it without having the gun placed to their heads to say that you cannot do this. We understand that. BRICS is the, is the alternative. But we cannot throw the baby out with the bath water. We have to ensure that the private sector is involved because that is how we're going to have checks and balances in spending, mm -hmm. checks and balances ensuring that you're getting the best value for money and, and, and the best optimum design of the infrastructure. So we need to have more concrete frameworks for executing these projects, all right? Yeah. And 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 therefore there needs to be a lot of conversation about how it is we're going to do this. And of course as I've mentioned before, you do a SWOT analysis. You you do the you you once you've created the framework, you analyze it. Mm -hmm. 
What are the strengths? What are the weaknesses? What are the opportunities? And what are the threats? Sure. Right? And you systematically go and, and, and you say, okay, fine, this framework, it doesn't have to be the, the framework that you use, but we're proposing it. You can have alternative solutions. Framework one, model one, framework model two, framework model three. Okay, we don't like framework model one because it doesn't offer us you know, the kind of flexibility that we need. So we're gonna to go to framework model two, okay, which has more flexibility. And so we have to essentially start putting more flesh onto the bones in terms of governance, in terms of how it is that we're gonna get these ideas that we have in our heads and so, so that we can start executing these projects because it's no time, Africa is waiting. We're, we're waiting impatiently, you know, for to see movement, see that the fruit of, 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 the, of the investment of time and energy in, in talking about BRICS and, and creating, you know, the BRICS development bank, it's no time for them to move. And to do this, you need the private sector involvement. Okay. Thank you for that, uh, Mr. Uh, Elisa. Uh, let's uh, uh, continue with you, uh, dear Yulia. Uh, we're almost uh, rounding off uh, with uh, the, uh, the program, but uh, there's in, it is important for us to, to analyze uh, this aspect. Uh, when we look at uh, the BRICS uh, and, of course, uh, and other uh, global pairs across the world, uh, we begin to ask, bringing uh, the African continent actually uh, uh, to the limelight. We are looking at how uh, the, uh, the t or to what extent can the, the BRICS platform, especially in uh, the uh, global context, where we have seen uh, so much uh, or the many changes, uh, especially in the political uh, sphere, which is actually affecting uh, the, the economic and the social sphere. So we're looking at uh, the place of uh, the, the BRICS uh, in ensuring that Africa's bargaining power in international trade and economic negotiations is actually uh, opted or, or maybe given uh, uh, momentum. Uh, some people are very critical uh, about, you know, Russia uh, is one of the BRICS nation and uh, critics of what has been happening lately are uh, like, okay, there's no difference. It's just gonna be uh, extraction of natural resources and uh, all the like. But then uh, uh, today we want to look at uh, the peculiarities to look at how BRICS nations individually and of course as a block under BRICS can function with African uh, partners in the areas of international trade and economic uh, negotiations of that will fast track the economic uh, development of countries af uh, across Africa. So how can BRICS help African nations in uh, boosting their bargaining power? Well, uh, BRICS creates uh, really good conditions for African countries in terms of their uh, negotiating position, right? Because uh, BRICS itself, uh, um, it implies uh, active participation of uh, India, China, and Russia. And uh, when we talk about those three, um, it's, um, it's uh, very uh, important to understand that, well, China is the uh, top uh, country in the world right now in terms of economy and in terms of production, right? Mm -hmm. So China is, um, is at the top uh, in terms of its uh, industrial potential and in terms of its potential investment. Uh, then uh, India uh, is also a country that uh, can provide a lot of uh, technologies, a lot of uh, joint ventures, joint, joint projects that could be implemented in Africa. India also has uh, very uh, close historic ties with Africa. And uh, in many countries, uh, Indian population uh, has been around for many centuries, right? Uh, uh, South Africa, Zambia, and many other uh, countries have, uh, you know, very uh, close uh, historic ties and uh, up to 10% of Indian population there uh, that has been present for decades and centuries. So it's also very important because uh, those human ties are the ones along which uh, the business flows, the projects uh, flow, etc. So it's important to highlight this fact as well. And when we talk about Russia and its current role at the uh, global arena, well, um, 
Russia is at the uh, front lines of the uh, struggle for the new world uh, order, or let's say uh, uh, the uh, uh, polycentric, multipolar, as it's called, world order. And Russia is at the uh, heated front lines of it. So uh, um, Russia has uh, less to offer in terms of uh, finance, in terms of investment, uh, but it has a lot to offer in terms of durable uh, uh, technologies and it has a lot to offer in terms of uh, a new uh, let's say uh, value and ideological basis for this kind of cooperation but when we look at it in a complex way we see that uh, you know there are two aspects to it right the uh, material or financial aspect and uh, th this other one that could be called spiritual or value-based or uh, whatever else uh, could be an appropriate synonym. And those two have to be balanced, right? Because focusing just simply on ideology and focusing on value systems, but not paying enough attention to the uh, uh, material side of things uh, would make it just go to, uh, you know, the uh, castles in the sky kind of concepts and at the same time being over focused on the material side of things and being over focused on commercial bases and uh, profits it kills the uh, spirit of the happening and it leads to situations similar to the ones we're observing now with all the different kinds of neo-colonial practices uh, being um, implemented on the African continent, in Asia, in Latin America, and even in Russia itself, right? Uh, and those practices, the, the neo-colonial approaches and mechanisms, they uh, basically mean that profits have to be extracted by any means possible, right? Uh, without uh, kind of caring at uh, the damages that it causes to the population of those uh, colonized countries, but colonized using the uh, the new uh, political and economic uh, uh, mechanisms of uh, influence and domination, let's say. So, well, um, you know, just to finish uh, this uh, point and just to start wrapping off uh, this discussion, I would like to emphasize that BRICS creates unique opportunities uh, with the presence of China, with the presence of Russia, with the presence of India, and well, Brazil at the moment uh, should be, uh, uh, as I understand, uh, should be acting a bit more uh, in a bit more active way. But so far, we haven't been uh, noticing much of uh, you know initiatives coming from Brazil within the BRICS. Uh, but that could unfold later on. But uh, BRICS itself uh, offers a lot of opportunities and offers a qu quite a balanced approach uh, where, you know, India, China and Russia do not really compete between each other, but act as uh, complementary partners. Okay, thank you so much, uh, uh, dear Yulia. Let's uh, end with you, Mr. Ellis, of course, uh, with this question. We are looking at the, the aspect of uh, diversification, of uh, economic diversification and uh, industrialization. So how does uh, the, the BRICS uh, partnership influence uh, Africa's quest for economic diversification and uh, industrialization? Thank you, Clara. It's, it's a very, BRICS offers a unique opportunity for having options for Africa. Africa has options. Indeed. You've come to the end of an era with a dollar and we're moving into a new paradigm. The question is, what paradigm is this? Is it the BRICS paradigm? If it's going to be the BRICS paradigm, it needs to take very concrete steps in order to push this new paradigm forward and of course taking into consideration what mrs burgess said um you know any risk of, of subversion of state sovereignty okay we understand we need to prevent this from happening and i completely agree um in that we need to have the balance between the 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 need for looking at the economic part of it in terms of commercial part of it and, and ambitions versus the spirit because those things must be balanced. Of course, I completely understand that. But I would start by asking, what are the projects that we want to uh, accomplish? 
you list them. The question is, then why? Because we want prosperity for Africa. We want, or, or for, for Russian citizens, for Indian citizens, for the Chinese citizens, for the Brazilian citizens, all right? And then we create the model that the BRICS plus then will then come and be able to slot in into this architecture. What is the architecture? We are still developing it, but an architecture is still desired for execution of projects. The question then becomes how? This is the model that we're talking about now. And then when and where? All of these things as a clean sheet, you can essentially start putting together essentially um, a roadmap, right? And this roadmap could be very encouraging for Africa. We can know, for example, uh, if you're in Cameroon, by 2030, we will have X amount of additional generation. We, 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 we will have nuclear. We will have this type. You know, for, for um, Douala, we're going to make sure that the population is increasing X amount per annum. Therefore, we're going to have X amount of, of, of new generation, X amount of housing, X amount of water infrastructure, right? X amount of energy. Start putting these things down as a vision so that we can say, okay, fine. We see that we want to achieve this by 2030. How are we going to achieve it? And let us start to actually, you know, put something, the flesh on the bone, as I like to say, because now it's time to put more solidity in, in, in the bricks so that it starts building a solid portfolio of projects and start, and start achieving these things so that we can say, aha, the BRICS is successful or can be successful because we have these things in the pipeline and we have accomplished X, Y, and Z. And so therefore, Africa and the BRICS have a great, um, Africa in BRICS has a great opportunity, but it takes leadership, real leadership, right? And leadership does not mean tyranny leadership means okay means vision right and then having the ability to then put concrete steps in achieving this vision and this is really what i would like to see okay uh, thank you so much uh, mr ellis uh, indeed we still have much to talk about uh, but uh, we cannot uh, push through because uh, we've actually exhausted uh, the time allocated for this program, but we're looking forward to having uh, more engagement on this very important uh, uh, topic, which is very vast and significant, to continue to edify or to uh, highlight uh, the importance uh, uh, aspect or important aspect of the BRICS group and how the African uh, continent can actually uh, benefit from the partnership with the uh, uh, BRICS uh, nation. Uh, we are talking about the partnership with China, Russia, Brazil, India, and uh, what a few. And uh, of course, I want to appreciate uh, you all for your great insight, uh, uh, Yulia Berg and uh, Clifton Ellis, uh, for the great insight on this uh, very uh, uh, particular uh, topic. We continue to make constructive, uh, discursive programs that will continue to change the narratives positively in making the world uh, a global, which is a global village, very safe uh, for correlation both at every uh, level, be it a political, economic, or social level, and uh, also appreciating the technicians for ensuring that this program was a success. I want to draw the curtains into this edition of Views on the Continent now, but don't go away. Uh, keep enjoying the programs on African media information. Remember that information is power. Thank you so much. Thank <music> you.